Welcome to our applicants for general surgery residency who are in the ether somewhere. I can't even see that you're here. I I'm going to trust that by Zoom there, there are applicants out there watching us, watching your every move. So welcome all of you, and uh, we'll tell you a little bit more about the program here in a little while, but it's my great pleasure this morning to introduce our grand round speaker, Dr. Chris Jones. He is the Dr. Hiram Folk and Mrs. Lily Banerjee Endowed Chair in the Department of Surgery, Chief of the Division of Transplantation. Uh, he did his, uh, uh, he went to college at, at Brown University. He's an Ivy Leaguer, you know. Uh, went to Georgetown for medical school and then did his surgery residency at Vanderbilt Fellowship at UCLA in transplant. And we were fortunate to grab him immediately out of fellowship to recruit him here to the University of Louisville for our transplant program where he's become uh, a, a true leader in, a, in the world of transplant in America. He's done a fantastic job running transplant program. He's widely published. He's a great mentor, a great teacher. He, he contributes in every possible way to the Department of Surgery. And uh, you'll see why here in just a minute. Dr. Jones, we thank you for everything that you do. And uh, we look forward to your grand rounds. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. McMasters. I appreciate that introduction. Uh, I, too, would like to welcome our uh, prospective residents uh, that are joining us virtually. Uh, hopefully something will be said or done that will inspire you to um, join us here at uh, this country's greatest uh, general surgery uh, training program. Um, today, we're going to talk about healthcare disparities and kidney transplantation. <clears throat> I have uh, no disclosures. Uh, the objectives are as you see here. Uh, I would like to say that uh, the topic was broken up into uh, two different um, uh, genres. We'll talk about deceased donor kidney transplant initially, uh, and secondly, we'll talk about uh, living uh, kidney uh, donor uh, transplantation. Uh, and throughout, we'll talk a little bit about what we're doing here at the University of Louisville. I think, first of all, before we get going, we need to kind of talk about the definition of uh, health disparities. Uh, health and healthcare disparities refer to differences in health and health care between populations. Now, it's very important to know that disparities in both health and health care are related terms, but not synonymous. Health disparity refers to a higher burden of illness or morbidity or um, <clears throat> disability uh, in one group versus another, despite right, whether or not that group has health insurance or access to care or so forth. Uh, health and health care disparities refer to differences that can't be explained by variations in health needs or patient preferences. Now, it's important to know that health inequality and health inequity is used interchangeably with health disparity. So when you see those terms, you have to understand that they can um, be used interchangeably. In 2003, the Institute of Medicine wrote a book called Unequal Treatment. They looked at the um, disparities that occurred both at the um, macro level as well as the micro level and determined kind of what uh, caused racial and ethnic disparities. The Institute of Medicine Study Committee defines disparities as healthcare, uh, in healthcare as racial or ethnic differences in the quality quality, that's a black box term, but um, quality of healthcare that are not due to access related factors, clinical needs, patient preferences, and appropriateness of intervention. So how is it that we can move forward and get uh, equity in our healthcare and such that we move towards uh, a more just uh, healthcare system? And this is a slide that has kind of floated around uh, for the last couple of years, but I think it bears repeating um, in terms of understanding the differences between equality and equity. Equality is basically the assumption that everyone benefits from the same supports. Equity is a little more nuanced and personalized, right? Basically, people are able to get the specific supports that they need in order to navigate the healthcare system appropriately. 
uh, once we can get rid of all of the things that cause inequities in our healthcare system, we then achieve uh, social justice within the healthcare system. So what are those factors that influence healthcare, right? What are the things that we have to do in order to make sure that there are no inequities in uh, healthcare? As some of you may have guessed, it starts out with policies and programs. Right? and development of policies and programs. I'd just like to take the privilege of the podium for one minute to say that there's been a lot of talk over the last two to three years about um, physicians and surgeons staying in their lane. Right? Dr. Miller talked a little bit about this in his grand rounds. It's very important to know, and this is for medical students and residency, it is important that you are in the midst of policy and program development. Right? What better person other than the doctor taking care of a patient right, um, to put these programs and policies together? Right? Not administrators, not politicians. Right? Yes, we have to work with those people, but you should be at the table um, making these policies and so forth. Right? I'm proud to be at the University of Louisville. Where we have a lot of lane shifters. Right? There's a lot of people that switch lanes here, right? Starting at the helm with Dr. McMasters, Dr. Polk, Dr. Jason Smith, right? Dr. Jamie Coleman, Dr. Russ Farmer. All of these people have recognized that, you know, the status quo just won't do. We have to do something different for our medical students, for our residents, for our junior faculty, and most importantly, our patients. Because we know that policies and programs directly influence these health factors, right? These health factors are really social determinants of health. Your social determinants of health dictate how well you will do uh, in terms of your health outcomes, your quality of health, and uh, your length of life, having that quality of health. So it's very important to get involved, okay, when it comes to this. Now let's just talk a little bit about epidemiology of kidney disease. How does all of this play a role in that? Um, this is a slide uh, from 2018. Not much has changed uh, from this. Um, and we basically have about 15% of US adults with chronic kidney disease. So there's 300 million people in the United States. There's about 45 million people with chronic kidney disease. A little over half a million of those patients are on dialysis. And at the time, in 2018, there was about 78,000 people on the kidney transplant waiting list. That number, five years later, has ballooned to over 100,000 uh, people. But what does remain is that we really only transplant about 22 to 23,000 people um, for kidney transplants a year. And of those patients, about 6,500 of them are living kidney uh, donors. So what are the causes of end-stage kidney disease, right? As you can see here, the top causes are diabetes and hypertension. No surprise to anybody in this room, right? But a close third is other. That's where you and I come into account, right? 2% of people with chronic kidney disease, right, is caused by us. Right? And that's because of folks that get cardiac surgeries performed and people who get cardiac testing. So it's very important to know if you truly need that contrasted study before you can do your procedure on a patient because you can throw a person from chronic kidney disease into end-stage renal disease. It's very important. This is just uh, trends of end-stage renal disease, uh, incident cases and incident rates. Uh, the incident cases are all individuals who change in status from chronic kidney disease to end-stage renal disease. And this is looking at it over the time period of 1980 to 2012. But if you look at the incident rate there, this is the number of new cases of end-stage renal disease divided by the number of persons at risk for the disease. And what you can see here is that um, uh, Black and African-American ethnicity uh, far outweighs all of the other uh, ethnicities uh, that are represented here. We do the same thing for uh, the Hispanic population. And again, you can see that uh, Hispanic versus non-Hispanic incident races, rates are much greater uh, than non-Hispanic. 
So what's the incidence rate of chronic kidney disease? Well, this is a heat map showing that. And what you can see here is that um, the dark blues are mainly uh, on the eastern side uh, of the country here. And some of that is because of population density. Um, Kentucky is here. And what you can see is that there's a lot of uh, chronic kidney disease in the southeastern part uh, of the United States. So what does this have to do with people on the kidney transplant wait list? Well, you have to have chronic kidney disease or end-stage renal disease to be put on the kidney transplant wait list. Approximately 100,000 people are on the wait list. Uh, in order to get off of the wait list, right, um, the best way to do that is to get transplanted. Uh, the number one way in which to do that is by um, um, deceased donor kidney transplant. Uh, the next way to do that is by living uh, donors. We transplant about 30% in this country, about 30% of people are transplanted off the wait list uh, with uh, living donors. However, we're not so fortunate in the state of Kentucky. Only about 8% of people uh, in the state of Kentucky are transplanted off the wait list with a uh, living kidney donor. Now, a number that's you know not insignificant is the number of people who are uh, too sick and can't progress to transplantation uh, on the wait list and those who pass away while waiting for a kidney transplant on the wait list. So median wait times, right? So time matters when it comes to transplantation, right? So it depends on your blood group in terms of how quickly you move forward to getting a kidney transplant. Blood group O and B tend to uh, have the longest median wait times, approximately five years. Uh, if you're blessed to uh, be a blood group AB, you get transplanted fairly quickly, right? And so this is what it looks like basically for the majority of the United States. Um, unless you're in California or Oregon or Washington, um, <clears throat> where blood group A tends to have a, the longest median uh, wait times. This is just a slide um, showing basically uh, what we've said. The important thing to see here, it's very slight, but if you were to get transplanted off the wait list with a living kidney donor, the first two years are your best years of being transplanted with a living kidney donor, right? As we know, when you get up to be about five years from waiting uh, on the wait list, um, that's when you get the maximum number of people who are transplanted um, during that time period. So what are the characteristics of adult patients on the wait list? And this is SRTR, our Scientific Registry of Transplant Recipients, and UNOS data comes out every 10 years. And what they looked at is kind of the demographics of people who are waiting for uh, kidney transplants, right? So if we were just to distill this down and look at race and look at the people who are waiting for a kidney transplant in 2002, about 41% of those people are white, whereas 36% of those people are Black or African American. In 2012, 10 years later, right, about 38% of the people waiting for a kidney transplant are white and 34% are African American. Now, if you were to say, all right, those are the people who are waiting, who actually gets transplanted off of the list? What you can see here is the demographics, again, of the people who actually get transplanted. And in 2020, of white individuals waiting on the transplant list in 2002, 60% of those individuals were transplanted off of the wait list whereas only about 20% of African-Americans were transplanted off the wait list. In 2012, about 52% of people were, um, of uh, white folks were transplanted off the list, whereas only about a quarter of black folks were transplanted off of the kidney transplant wait list, right? Waiting is not, not detrimental, right? This is very important. Right. The, there's a there's a issue with waiting on the kidney transplant list. Right. We already kind of talked about it in both the pre transplant phase as well as the post transplant phase. In the pre transplant phase, you can become too sick and not progress on to get transplant or you can die on the wait list. Right. In the post transplant um, time, it can have deleterious effects on both the patient and the graft. 
And that's what these Kaplan-Meier curves are showing. If you look on the y-axis of the curve here, this is the percent event-free graft survival or the percent event-free patient survival. On the x-axis here is post-transplant time in months. And what you can see here is that the longer you're on dialysis, okay, your percent event-free graft survival or patient survival decreases, right? And that's because people develop what we call dialysis physiology, right? This can't be changed overnight with putting a kidney in, right? So we really have to think about who we transplant um, depending on how long they've been on uh, dialysis. <clears throat> So I hope I've shown you here that it's more important, if you can, to get off of dialysis, off of the kidney transplant wait list to be transplanted. This is just a graph showing that your uh, years of life more closely mimic that of the um, you know, general population if you're transplanted rather than if you stay on uh, dialysis. So why is it that we can't transplant African-Americans off of the wait list? Like what's going on? Why do we get more of our Caucasian counterparts that actually get transplanted off of the wait list, right? Well, there's a whole host of factors that play a role in this in addition to health and healthcare disparities, right? There's psychosocial issues, cultural factors, transplant knowledge, but here again, down below, this box here basically is the social determinants of health. Social determinants of health um, play a major role in terms of people uh, moving forward uh, in the healthcare system and especially transplant. But I'd like to just focus, if I can, just on cultural factors real quick. Why is it that we can't get, you know, people of color uh, and more importantly, African-Americans even in to just get a routine checkup, much less a kidney transplant, right? Well, it's all history, right? So this is uh, the 1793 Philadelphia yellow fever. A very prominent physician at the time, Dr. Benjamin Rush, petitioned um, the Black leaders in Philadelphia at that time to encourage the um, Black folks in the population to assist as grave diggers, body and trash collectors, and housekeepers for those people who had yellow fever. He falsely believed that Black people were immune to the yellow fever. However, when it was all said and done with this outbreak, um, 5,000 people died. 10% of them were Black, despite making up only 6%, right, of the population of Philadelphia at the time. Well, we can get more recent, and most of us in this room know about this, but uh, there may be some who don't. And this is the Tuskegee Syphilis Institute uh, uh, study. And basically in 1932, the United States Public Health Service and Tuskegee Institute took 600 black men and they told them that, hey, your blood is tainted or bad and we need to help you with this. The participants weren't made aware of their diagnosis. However, the vast majority of them had syphilis. Unfortunately, none of them were treated even when uh, a treatment became available. Many years later, uh, the U.S. government gave $9 million to, to the families that they could find. If you calculate that out, it's about $15,000 per patient. Is that what a life is worth? I don't know. But what about organ transplant? Why don't people of color, and in particular African Americans, participate in organ donation or transplantation? So in preparation for this talk, my research led me to this book, The Organ Thieves by Chip Jones. It's a great read, only 232 pages. It's a true story that took place in the 1960s. You see, at this time, there was a race among Southern institutions to perform the first heart transplant in the segregated South. The central theme of the book is that a working class Black man named Bruce Tucker had gone missing somewhere in the bowels of the hospital labyrinth after having been treated for a massive head injury. When Bruce is found, a team of white MCV, at the time Medical College of Virginia, now Virginia Commonwealth University, um, biomedical researchers without any informed consent cut out his heart and transplanted it into a white businessman. William, Bruce's brother, seeks justice, and that's mainly what the book is about. The focus was on the legal medical definition of when life ends. Is a breathing heart, beating heart the sign of life, or is a dead brain the sign of death? 
exactly when does death occur? When somebody dies, who owns the body? And what about informed consent? Or in this case, notifying the next of kin, right? These are all things we talk about now as being myths in terms of why people should, you know, uh, participate in organ donation and transplantation. But at some point in history, it was a truth to somebody. And that's what I want to get across to you guys, right? Myths don't just pop out of thin air, right? There was a truth to somebody at some point in the past. So very important to uh, keep these in mind. And it's very important to make sure that you know 100% that what you are doing, okay, is going to benefit your patient population. It's the only way we can instill confidence in what it is that we're doing. Well, sad to say uh, that this, this is a New York Times article that just came out November 22nd, 2023. And we're still asking the same questions we did 60 years ago. When does life stop? Right? Why would you want to participate in organ donation and transplantation? Sorry for the graininess of this picture, but um, this was the only one that I could get. I want to introduce you to Lucille Parker. Lucille Parker is the longest continuous run dialysis patient in the United States. Um, she was on dialysis for approximately 47 years. But that's not the interesting thing about Lucille. Lucille asked to be uh, recommended for kidney transplantation over 100 times in her life. And over 100 times, she was denied. Not in a malicious way, right? It was more of, you're doing so well on dialysis. Why would you want to go and potentially have a kidney transplant that might fail or may not work or have to pay for the medications that comes along with getting a kidney transplant, right? The other interesting thing about Lucille is that she is a distant cousin to the second wife of Dr. Tom Stargill. If that's not irony, I don't know what it is. She will have a documentary um, done. Uh, she just passed away in April of 2023 um, by the same uh, person who did the documentary uh, on Dr. Starzl. Tell so, them who Dr. Starzl is. Sorry. Tell them who Dr. Starzl is. Really. Sure. We're going to get to him in a second, too. So Dr. Starzl is basically the father of uh, modern day transplantation uh, in this country. Uh, he performed a lot of the different uh, techniques uh, as well as did a lot of the bench side research to develop the immunosuppressants that we use today uh, to keep uh, our organ transplants uh, uh, doing well. There's a lot of stories I'm sure that are just like Lucille's, but I believe one of the greatest deterrents to African-American people being put on the transplant waiting list is the glomerular filtration rate, the estimated GFR. As most of us in this room know, it is a clinical assessment of kidney function that's central to the practice of medicine. It's widely accepted as the best index of kidney function in both health and disease. The estimated GFR based on serum creatinine is reported basically in every clinical laboratory now. The important thing to know that if you feel like there's an inaccuracy in the estimated GFR, you can perform a measured GFR as a confirmatory uh, test. So for our medical students, what we do when we're trying to uh, figure out uh, the GFR is we have to take into account the uh, creatinine. So we look at a person's age, uh, their sex, and their race. And we take these non-GFR uh, determinants, such as muscle mass, nutritional health, and other factors such as albumin level, urea level, and BMI. And we put all of this together in equations and we come up with the creatinine. What we know is that changes in serum creatinine are predominantly the effects of what we see in GFR. So creatinine serves as an indicator okay, of GFR. And that's shown in these equations um, that are here. 
The first equation is the Kakov Galt equation. This is the equation I learned when I was in medical school and part of residency. Um, more newer equations are the MDRD study equation and the CKD equation. Uh, equations two and three, as you can see, as indicated in the red writing, uh, has a multiplier for African Americans or people of uh, African ancestry. In 1999, Dr. Andrew Levy wanted to develop a more accurate method to estimate the glomerular filtration rate. Dr. Levy's whole initiative was to create a paradigm that defined and outlined the stages of kidney disease. You see, before 1999, there was no such thing as chronic kidney disease. Sure, people threw out the term, but we didn't know exactly what it meant. So Dr. Levy wanted to give clinicians a way to identify and classify the disease and give patients a way to comprehend the severity of their disease. How close am I to needing dialysis? He was on a quest to develop groundbreaking equations to estimate the levels of kidney function um, from routinely measured uh, uh, levels. So he came up with the MDRD equation, which is the Modification of Diet and Renal Disease Study Equation. It was more precise and inclusive than the kakov galt equation. It was less cumbersome than measuring the 24-hour urine creatinine clearance. But what remained is that there was a multiplier for people of uh, African ancestry. Why is that? Why was there a multiplier put on there? Subsequent research by Dr. Levy and others found that serum creatinine levels were higher among African-American adults who had the same measured GFR as their white adult counterparts, indicating that determinants of serum creatinine levels and other differed between groups. So this is what gave him the notion to add a multiplier um, onto uh, the equation for African-Americans. This is the EGFR milestones, and I'm sorry, it's probably a little difficult to read, um, but the important thing to know here is that in 1999, um, Dr. Lee came up with the equation, and almost 15 years later, right, there was 90% penetration of EGFR reporting in all of our clinical laboratories around the country, right? So this was signed, sealed, and delivered by the College of American Pathologists, which is the regulatory body for our clinical laboratories uh, around the country. So that was the equation that was always used. A number of studies have examined the transferability of the EGFR equation to non-American Black populations, such as populations in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Ghana, and the Ivory Coast. However, this issue is not settled. Various studies have assessed the utility of the MDRD equation with and without the race coefficient for use in these populations. All of these studies came up with competing results. This in itself highlights the artificial nature of race as a social rather than a biological construct and its limited utility as applied to estimating the GFR. In fact, the race coefficient in the MDRD equation is presumably correcting for some other poorly characterized factor, which raised the baseline serum creatinine levels in the initial study participants. So in 2017, um, the calls for removing race from the estimated glomerular filtration rate um, became, be, got louder and louder. Why, why is this so important? Well, your GFR dictates a lot. It dictates who can get on the transplant list and who can't get on the transplant list. It dictates who can be referred to a nephrologist versus who can't be referred to a nephrologist. And these are some of the milestones here, right? To be on the transplant wait list, you have to have a GFR of 20, right? If you have this multiplier in place, what ends up happening is your GFR tends to be higher than 20, and it keeps you from being on the kidney transplant wait list. This is just an example um, here with um, uh, uh, looking at the difference between um, a white uh, female and a black female. And if you see here for an 80-year-old female with a serum creatinine of one, okay, 
a white woman would be deemed to have chronic kidney disease, right? Because her levels would be lower than an African-American woman whose levels would be higher, right? So she wouldn't be eligible for medications and so forth um, for having chronic kidney disease because she doesn't fit into that. For somebody who is 55 years old with a serum creatinine of 2.8, a white woman would be referred for a transplant. However, a black woman would not because her EGFR would be too high. So it has real consequences um, from this. So does the use of race and kidney function estimation restrict access to care? I would say yes. Yes, it does. So this is a, a graph looking at the uh, difference between two EGFRs in African-American patients uh, versus measured GFRs. And basically what has to happen is your GFR has to be to the left of these lines before you can be referred for kidney transplantation or for uh, uh, nephrology referral, right? And what you can see is the vast majority of people fall to the right of those lines when you use uh, uh, a non-race neutral EGFR. So what is the impact of this, right? Um, if we get rid of uh, the race coefficient uh, in determining the GFR, right? CKD diagnosis will explode. People who probably should be seen by a nephrologist will now be seen by a nephrologist, right? Kidney donation would go down, and that's probably okay. We'll talk about that in a minute. Drug dosing would have to change some in terms of medications for heart and kidney uh, disease. Medicare coverage would be better because people would now have health services for kidney disease. Specialist referral would go up. And if uh, deemed appropriate, people would be placed on the kidney transplant uh, wait list. So how are we doing here at the University of Louisville? So after this got implemented earlier this year in 2023, the race neutral EGFR, uh, all of our kidney candidates have been sent one letter, just explaining to them what's going on and what's happening. Of 72 of 115 African-American patients have received a wait time modification. We've been able to gain an average of 25 months of waiting time per patient, 1,835 months in total. And since implementing, 17 African-American patients have been transplanted who have received an average of 37 months of wait time. There's probably more now. This was at the end of October, right? So it's definitely been very good for our patient population here. This is Naomi and Kinsey, and she is credited along with five other medical students with leading the effort to remove race from kidney function estimates. We don't have time to really go into all of the details, but suffice it to say, in 2017, as a third year medical student, her efforts started in earnest after recognizing that the status quo was no longer acceptable. So I put this up here for our medical students, right? This is just to say, no matter what your station in life is, you too can make a difference. If you see something, say something, right? If something's not right, inquire about it, do your research on it, do your due diligence, right? And make changes, right? Because it can help a lot of other people um, moving on. All right, the second part of the lecture, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, uh, living donor kidney transplantation, right? And we're gonna talk about the evolution of kidney uh, transplantation and then talk about the challenges in assessing donor risk. Sorry. So, as you, most of you know, there's been many of surgeon and scientists who experimented with xenografts in the 1800s. However, many of those grafts didn't work because they didn't have the surgical techniques or transplant immunological knowledge uh, to make those uh, work. Um, over time, uh, our surgical techniques improved, our understanding of transplant immunology improved, and instead of transplanting uh, between species, we were able to transplant our own species. We began doing homographs uh, in the 1900s. However, what is old is new again. I'm sure many of you guys have read about this uh, in the paper, um, but there's been a lot of uh, swine transplanted into people, right? Either as a heart or as a kidney. 
And this too is because of our better understanding of transplant immunology. And this gets really at the heart of our supply and demand uh, with organs uh, in this country uh, as well. The first living kidney transplant on record was performed by Dr. Yuri Voronov in the Soviet Union. Uh, this is just the illustration showing uh, the thigh position Dr. Voronov used in his pioneering human homograph transplant. Uh, he took a 26-year-old female who consumed mercury as a means to commit suicide. Uh, she was blood group O, uh, and he took a kidney from a 60-year-old blood group B donor who was not long for this world. Uh, and transplanted uh, this 60-year-old kidney into this 26-year-old female. Uh, the kidney made about four to five cc's of urine uh, and then stopped uh, abruptly. Uh, the patient then um, uh, abruptly uh, died, as you might uh, expect. In the 1930s, we began uh, to get a little bit more uh, in tune uh, with skin grafting. Uh, we began to experiment a lot more with this. James Barry Brown successfully uh, grafted skin from one identical twin uh, to the other. Uh, Dr. Peter Metterwar also um, dabbled with skin grafting uh, as well. And Dr. Metterwar was awarded the 1960 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine jointly with Sir McFarlane Burnett for their discovery of acquired immunological tolerance. Metawar provided experimental evidence that confirmed Burnett's theory of immunological tolerance, which hypothesized that the concept of self was defined by the immune system during embryogenesis. In 1953, Jean Hamburger um, did the first living kidney transplant in Paris, France. Uh, he transplanted a 16-year-old uh, who fell off of a scaffolding and injured his solitary kidney. The patient's mother had heard that other places around the world were experimenting with live kidney donation, so she offered up herself to donate a kidney. Uh, the kidney actually did well for approximately 22 days. However, it abruptly stopped. We think it's probably because of rejection uh, at that time. Um, the patient's um, renal failure returned uh, and he, he passed away. And then in 1954, what we all uh, hopefully know in this room is that we had the first successful uh, kidney transplant that was done by Ronald, uh, sorry, that was done by Joseph and jo Joseph Murray and John Merrill on Ronald and Richard Herrick. They were identical twin brothers, right? Um, it was such a rousing success that this Boston team performed transplants on 29 pairs of twins and had very good success uh, moving forward. So what about our surgical techniques? So this is the way I learned how to do uh, donor nephrectomies. It was great. Um, we would put people uh, in the lateral decubitus decision, uh, position. And what we would do is we'd make a flank incision just above the most inferior rib. Most times the rib was removed um, when, we did the, when we did it. Sorry, I don't know why I did that. Uh, <laughs> but as you might expect, this caused a lot of pain and the donors ended up leaving well after the recipients were uh, discharged. Now we're able to do minimally invasive single port operations or robotic operations to remove uh, uh, the kidney. I would be remiss if I didn't mention this guy. This is Dr. Lloyd Ratner. Uh, he's a professor of surgery uh, at Columbia University, and he pioneered the way that we do our uh, donor nephrectomies here at the University of Louisville, which is a um, uh, hand-assisted laparoscopic donor nephrectomy. So the patient is placed in the lateral decubitus position. The midline is marked. We're able to put in a hand port. Uh, we're able to put in a camera port and a dissection port. And this is... Um, Oh, it looks like we noticed somebody. Uh, this is Dr. Adamson uh, doing a case, and I believe this is Dr. Tuman uh, who is uh, assisting uh, with doing a uh, living donor uh, nephrectomy. Dr. Adamson has to find a few things before we can make sure that it's safe to remove the kidney. All right, and this is for our medical students. He has to identify the aorta and the uh, renal vein, I'm sorry, the renal artery coming off of the aorta. He then also has to identify the renal vein 
All right. And below this red cell infused fluid here is the uh, inferior vena cava. All structures have to be identified before we can remove uh, the kidney. While Dr. Adamson is doing that, in the recipient room, we are uh, getting ready to uh, expose uh, the vessels. And what you can see here, again, for our medical students, is that this is our psoas muscle here. This is the uh, femoral uh, nerve of the general genital femoral uh, nerve trunk. And these are our iliac vessels, right? Once we get our vessels out, the two teams talk. And when it is safe, the kidney is stapled out. Okay, um, the recipient surgeon is in the room ready and waiting uh, to receive the kidney uh, at that time. Uh, the kidney is placed on ice and taken to the other room. Dr. Adamson, once the kidney is out, has to look at his staple line. So here's the aorta, and this is the stump of the renal artery, and there doesn't appear to be uh, much exsanguination uh, going on there, and this is the staple line for uh, the renal vein. Both look fairly good. At this time, Dr. Addison dries up and proceeds with closing of the uh, donor. In the other room, the kidney is flushed of the donor's blood and prepared for implantation. I apologize for this, it's a little blurry, uh, but I wanted you guys to see. This is the kidney uh, up here. It's nice and pink, very well perfused. Um, but what you can see here, this is the renal artery into side anastomosis into the uh, iliac artery. And this is the renal vein into side to the iliac vein. And then this structure is our ureter going down to the bladder uh, with a double J stent that's in place. We're able to do a lot of these operations because of Dr. Thomas Starzl. Again, a pioneer in uh, transplantation. Um, but in 1963, Dr. Starzl came up and introduced the notion of combined therapy. Uh, he introduced steroids uh, in addition to azathioprine. And this has done wonders for our graft survival. Graft survival improved from 30%, why it keeps doing that, from 30% to 90%. OK, uh, and as you can see, there's been a whole host of immunosuppressants that have come up on the market uh, and uh, they all basically achieved what Dr. Starzl found in 1963, and that's just combined therapy. Living kidney donation um, peaked in 2004 and then declined. There's a whole host of reasons for this. We're not 100 percent sure of one thing or the other in terms of this being the case. However, um, we do know that living kidney donation offers the best long-term survival. And this is what we can see here, right? Patient survival uh, in living donor is better than what we see with deceased donor. And the same thing with graft survival, not here. Again, just as with deceased donor kidney transplants, dialysis time determines living kidney transplant outcome, right? That dialysis physiology makes a big difference. If you're preemptive, meaning you've never seen dialysis before, those people tend to have the greatest um, percent event-free survival. This is a graph just showing basically the disparities that are still out there between uh, um, uh, white individuals and black individuals in terms of who gets a uh, living donor kidney transplant, right? So, um, African-American people are still lag behind in terms of getting living donors. We don't quite see that when it comes to deceased donor transplants, right? I think we basically got our act together to do the things that we needed to do in order to make sure deceased donor kidney transplant, uh, there was equity there. So in the early 2000s, the transplant community got together and said, hey, we don't want to repeat what happened with deceased donor kidney transplants. So we're going to put some policies and things in place uh, to help with living kidney donors, right? In the old days, we just, you know, if you were healthy and you wanted to donate a kidney, you just came on by and we took a kidney, right? But now there are actual rules and things that are in place. And we actually follow the kidney donor out to two years uh, as well. Uh, we've developed a National Living Donor Assistance Center to help with the financial burdens that people incur uh, when being a donor. 
Uh, there's an uh, independent living donor advocate. This person is there to make sure that they can help, right? To make sure that there is no coercion in terms of you giving a kidney. Living donor champion, we'll talk about it in a second. And then lastly, I just want to talk about the um, Advancing American Kidney Health Initiative in 2020. Uh, this was a mandate that was put in place by President Trump uh, in 2020 that said, hey, you know, if you are in a dialysis center, you have to be referred to a kidney transplant center, right? And so um, people were referred. And if we go back to our patient, Lucille Parker, uh, that we were talking about, right? This is the reason she was referred in 2020 is because she had to be referred in 2020. So let's just move on to talk about you know, we've talked a little bit about the cultural factors, psychosocial factors. We understand the social determinants of health. But what about people asking for a donor, right? Asking for somebody to donate a kidney to them, right? People of color, especially African-Americans, right? They don't even want you to know that they're sick, much less ask for a whole organ, you know? So what can we do to help with um, those things? There's something called the uh, Donor Champion. This started out as a research project at Hopkins, um, but it gained a lot of notoriety and um, people started adopting it at multiple different transplant centers around the country. Uh, and I'm happy to say we adopted this as well. One of the first things we ask patients when they come to our door is, you know, do you have a living donor? If not, do you have a living donor champion? All right, somebody to be able to help you. And this is basically a person or a team of people who have been identified to help that individual who needs a kidney with soliciting others for a potential kidney transplant. We're seeing an uptrend in living kidney donation again, which is great, finally. We're also seeing an increase in paired kidney exchanges uh, as well. So let's talk a little bit about the challenges of assess, assessing the donor risk, right? In 2004, there's the Amsterdam form that was done to look at the live kidney donor. And what they wanted to understand was the goals of, uh, goals of kidney donor evaluation. Um, so we wanted to know what was the lifetime risk of end-stage renal disease for a kidney donor based on their current risk factors. In absence of those risk factors, what's the likelihood of somebody progressing to end-stage renal disease, right? So they came up with um, absolute contraindications. Many of these are now out of date, but we had to come up with something at the time to make sure it was safe for people to donate uh, a kidney. We wanted to determine the individualized risk for each donor based on their demographics and you know, their modifiable and non-modifiable uh, risk factors. We wanted to individualize the long-term risks, right? Younger donors, right? What are the things younger donors have to think about? Well, younger donors, all right, especially women, they have to think of, is it going to be safe for me to donate and still, you know, have children later on, right? Older donors, you have to take into account their comorbidities uh, that they may have and if they can participate in donating. So it's a balancing act, right? You have to understand the benefits to the recipient, but the risk to the donor. Surgical risk is real, um, but I'm happy to say here at the University of Louisville, we have an ERAS protocol uh, for our live donors um, that uh, decide to donate. And with this, people uh, move to um, immediate bowel function uh, after uh, um, laparoscopic donation, uh, and their pain is fairly well controlled. Dr. Adamson has an 88% post-op day one discharge rate um, for our laparoscopic uh, donors. Financial risk, as we've talked about, there's now a National Living Donor Assistance Center, right, that can help people, right? Because if you're working every day just to put food on the table, the last thing you're going to think about is donating a kidney if you have to miss work. Now there are procedures and policies that are in place that were led by surgeons, and I'm very happy to say by surgeons at this institution, right, to make this a national um, thing such that people can get the help that they need with um, finances. Right. So assess, the success of living kidney donation depends on the long-term health of each kidney donor. 
if you look at the lifespan of kidney donors uh, versus that of just all comers in the general population, it's very similar, right? Very similar. However, if you compare living donors to matched healthy non-donor population, you see that there's an increase in the relative risk of progressing to end-stage renal disease. This is most pronounced in our African-American patients, as you can see here. The donor-recipient relationship plays an important role as well in predicting the risk of end-stage renal disease. This tells me that there's probably something genetic as well. There are pathways from pre-donation metabolic and genetic risk factors um, to post-donation end-stage kidney disease. However, a lot of these are not well defined or understood. Sure, we have calculators and things that are out there, but it doesn't take into account the many nuances that are there um, that have to be looked at to determine if a person is going to move uh, to end-stage kidney disease after uh, donation. We also have to take into account a person's uh, genetics, right? These are, these are just some of the many uh, genetic issues uh, that are there uh, that we have to look at before we can determine if somebody can um, uh, donate. Oh, this thing. All right, almost done. APOL1, right? This is a gene um, that is um, found in African-Americans. Uh, it causes increased risk of hypertension and end-stage renal disease in Black donors compared with matched Black non-donors. The risk of end-stage renal disease is also higher among donors that are biologically related to the recipients. Their genetic variants in APOL1 have been associated with increased susceptibility to chronic kidney disease in African-American patients. The presence of two risk alleles is considered high risk versus zero or one allele, right? Well, that was before 2023. There was data that was just presented at the Southern Surgical that says, even if you have one allele, you may be at increased risk um, for uh, these uh, progressing to end-stage renal disease. So APOL1, high-risk genotype in Black living kidney donors, is associated with a lower pre- and post-donation kidney function. So the kidney you give to somebody is not going to work as long or as well, and the kidney that you are left with is not going to work as long or as well. So this becomes a problem, and you have to make sure people are able to get the genetic counseling that they need and there has to be a, a big discussion between um, the geneticist, the transplant center, and the patient to make sure that it is safe for them to donate. So in summer, living kidney donation has the best long-term outcomes for thousands of our chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal disease patients. We have to encourage and remove the barriers right, to waitlisting our end-stage renal disease patients and um, actually working up our living kidney uh, donors. The success of living kidney donation is 100% going to depend on how well our living kidney donors do. It becomes very important. And lastly, I just want to say, um, this is Carenza Townsend. Um, and she is um, the chief administrative officer of the yet to be built Norton West Louisville Hospital. Uh, I kind of bogarted my way into a meeting that I knew she was at uh, to act as an advocate for my patients. And so what we're going to do, hopefully, um, she tells me the hospital will be finished uh, November 24th of 2024. And what she told me is that we should work together and we're going to form an African-American transplant initiative where the patients that she sees at that hospital in the West end of town, which is predominantly African-American, um, uh, folks with kidney disease, they will shuttle over to us so that we can look at them and determine if they have eligibility to be put on the kidney transplant wait list. Um, so all of these things act as you know, advocates. Uh, for patients and for our medical students and residents in the room, you have to do things. You have to sometimes, my dad used to say, you have to dwell in 
uh, chaos sometimes because that's where your blessing is. And so it's very important to make sure that you get involved right, in that policy making program development in order to make sure that your patients do well so that we don't have disparities in bariatric surgery or disparities in kidney transplantation or any other uh, field uh, of medicine. With that, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jones. That's a very, very important grand round. Uh, I know we'll have some questions, and uh, I would just ask uh, the initiative you described about uh, leveling the playing field with the GFR mm -hmm. is uh, obviously a big advance forward. That's just going to increase the number of uh, African American patients who are eligible eligible to be on the transplant list. Well, what you described earlier in your talk was that of those on the waiting list, half as many African-American patients who are already on the waiting list get transplanted anyway. Correct. Uh, uh, so there's already a barrier uh, even when they get on the waiting list. And the Hispanic, Latinx patients were even worse. Correct. Uh, so my question is, you, you described a lot of things we can do to get patients on the list, but even once they're on the list, what do we need to do to uh, to improve and, and assure that more patients who are underrepresented can get transplants? Well, I think it starts with programs like I um, just talked about, this African-American transplant initiative. I think we have to be in the trenches, actually talking to patients early, not late, in their time of having kidney disease, but early to put it in their mind to let them know that, you know, hey, there are options for you other than staying on dialysis, right? The other thing that has to happen is there has to be, you know, more people that look like those people, right? So that we can instill confidence in that particular patient population to participate in you know, clinical trials or to participate in the healthcare um, process in general. And so I think there's a lot of work to be done. I think there definitely will be um, a backlog uh, of people that end up just being on the list, at least for the short while. But that's where our medical students and residents come in at, because they are going to come up with new things and new algorithms that will help us determine who can move forward, who are those best people to move forward um, uh, on the kidney transplant wait list. Other questions? Paul? I think three historical things I think we have uh, was a underemployed diabetic plastic surgeon whose principal job was teaching dog surgery for Sigma Medical Center. He then did the operation of the successful transplant and identical twins and then won the Nobel Prize 35 years later. The second story is about Dr. Starr, who the next to Dr. DeBate, the most important physician in the 20th century. He did this with just pure sweat and, and imagination. Interestingly, he got started out in a collateral training program. It was, it was 10 interns, one chief resident. He, of course, was eliminated from program for a decision. He then went on to play in a different place, went to a third place, and, uh, and was very successful. The rollout of, of uh, some improvement in racial medical care in Kentucky was our forgettable governor that I worked for for three years. Interestingly, he told me on Friday afternoon, he said, You ought to try to find a way to implement a problem here. He said, Why don't you call me back Monday afternoon and tell me what's the thing? Interesting, I went to a lady who ran Medicaid in Kentucky forever. His doctor told me that would be a simple plan. It was a six man Medicaid to all the people that under the insurance. See how many years does that take? It was about six months. So if you put 400,000 people on the moral Medicaid, and I say, by just imagination, the world can mm -hmm. mm -hmm. be People doing things like this all around. Mm -hmm. Just a very important story about education and politics and behavior. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, according to cultural factors, my observation on uh, readers in the country is that generally doctors and nurses feel differently and think differently and act differently towards black patients rather than white patients. Um, and so it might be that neither the patients nor the professional medical people have ever heard of graffiti. And so it's more of a current and ongoing issue rather than just a historical one. And my question is, if you have any advice for us, what is it regarding how we check our own attitude? Yeah, so I didn't get into that purposefully because that's a um, grand rounds in and of itself, right? Where we deal with our own biases as medical professionals. Um, I, I think, you know, an important thing that we have to do and something I've been trying to do, especially within the last three years, is to educate myself, right? And I think each individual has to have that, you know, reflection to say, hey, I want to educate myself so that I can know what's the best thing for this patient population. Why is this person acting this way towards me, you know, versus, you know, this other group or what have you. Um, I think there's a lot of education that has to go on in, you know, institutions like this. And I think having grand rounds like this and last week's grand rounds are important um, because I think that all plays a role into the education. All right, we're gonna have to stop there and thank Dr. Cho, <clears throat> Dr. Jones for a simply outstanding grand rounds and get on with our activities for our uh, applicants for general surgery residency. Thank you, Dr. Daniel.